Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will actually recall what is a primary decomposition theorem and uh, we will say actually some of its uh, consequences. Okay, so, let us uh, start with uh, V being finite dimensional vector space. Let us assume uh, we are working over complex numbers, let us stick with that. So, now uh, let us say T is a linear transformation that is uh, acting on V. Okay, it is a linear map. So, now uh, we want to actually write T as direct sum of uh, two operators. Okay. So, let me just uh, state the theorem. So, before stating the theorem, we need to recall few things from elementary linear algebra, which I will do it now. So, <coughs> given this uh, linear transformation, actually we can think this as element of this endomorphism of V. So, note that this endomorphism of V, it is an algebra. Okay. We have addition of uh, two operators and composition of operators that makes it actually endomorphism of V as an algebra over C. So, this is associative algebra over C. So, now this given T, we can construct this evolution map from this uh, polynomial algebra to this endomorphism of V. So, call it this evolution at T. So, which is a map from C bracket x to this endomorphism of V. So, this map is defined to be evaluating some polynomial P of x at this P of t. So, P of x goes to P of t and it is easy to check this map is actually uniquely determined by following uh, conditions. So, this evolution is an algebra map over C determined by the following conditions. Evolution T of x should be mapped to a T and the evolution of 1 is mapped to 1. This 1 is being identity on V. So, these conditions determine this evolution map. Okay, this map will play a role in what comes next. So, given this linear map, uh, we have defined this evolution map from the polynomial algebra, one variable polynomial algebra C x to this endomorphism of V given by P x goes to P t. Now, this is uh, uh, being actually uh, algebra map. So, in particularly this is a ring homomorphism. So, this targeted space endomorphism of V is actually finite dimensional. So, once we assume V is finite dimensional. So, let us say the dimension of V is over C is just n. So, now once we actually uh, say that this dimension is n, then the dimension of this endomorphism of V over C will be n square. Okay. This is we know from elementary linear algebra. So, now if we just put them together, if we look at this evolution map, which is a map from this uh, C x to this endomorphism of V. So, this map is actually uh, the target space being finite dimensional. So, that will imply this map having kernel. Okay. So, this is a finite dimensional vector space. So, that implies this evolution T has non-trivial kernel, non-trivial kernel. So, since we know that this map is actually algebra map, so in particularly the kernel of this map, the kernel of this evolution map, this is, is an ideal inside this C x. So, since C x is P i d, so that implies this kernel evolution t is actually generated by some polynomial of smallest degree. Okay. So, which we call it m of x. So, we make it actually modic, so that uh, this uh, choice of m of x becomes unique. So, we choose 
this m of x be monic. In particularly, so this once we make this monic choice, this becomes actually unique generator of this uh, kernel evolution t, which is an ideal inside your C x. So, note that what are all the properties of this m x. So, if I apply this evolution t on this m x, so then we get m of t. So, which is actually element of this endomorphism of V as an operator this must be 0 because this m x being inside the kernel ok. Since this m x is in the kernel of this evolution t. So, now if I have any other uh, polynomial f x suppose f x is in C x such that when you evaluate at t f of t is being 0 on capital V. So, then that should imply that this m of x should divide this f x ok. So, that is the definition of this m x being generator of this kernel of evolution t. Now, since m x being monic, so suppose if you have any other uh, polynomial of smallest degree such that m of uh, sorry m dash of t is 0, then that should imply that m x equal to m dash of x. So, m x is uniquely determined using the following property m x is uniquely determined by the following properties. One is m of t is being 0 on capital V and the second thing is if f of t is 0 for some f of x being inside C x then that should imply that m of x divides f of x ok. So, these two properties actually determine m of x in a <clears throat> Note that if f of t is congruent to 0 on capital V for some f of x inside C x, then that should imply the degree of m of x is strictly less than or equal to the degree of f of x as m of x divides f of x. So, now <clears throat> this m x we call minimal polynomial of t ok. So, this unique choice m x is called the minimal polynomial of t ok. So, to emphasize the dependent dependency of t we denote this by m t x ok. So, the minimal polynomial of t is denoted by m t of x. So, now once we have uh, this minimal polynomial, so minimal polynomial exists because this is infinite dimensional space, this is uh, finite dimensional space. So, the evolution map uh, uh, must be having non trivial kernel. So, that implies that this minimal polynomial exists. Now, once we work over complex number, this minimal polynomial can be factorized into linear factors. Using this linear factors, one can actually talk about primary decomposition of this capital V. So, let us see how to do that. So, here is the theorem. So, as before, we take dimension of V to be finite dimensional and T is a map from V to V, which is a linear map. So, we denote this m t of x to be the minimal polynomial of t, the minimal polynomial of t. So, let us write m t of x as product of linear factors x minus lambda 1 power some a 1 etcetera x minus lambda r power a r. Where this lambda 1 etcetera lambda r they are coming from complex numbers they are all distinct. 
so distinct roots of empty of x. So, now we can define what is called this uh, generalized eigenspace call it capital VI. So, which is the kernel of this uh, T minus lambda I I lambda I capital I. So, power you take it to be A. I. So, this is the generalized eigenspace associated with the eigenvalue lambda i. So, then what one can prove? We can prove that this v must be equal to direct sum of these generalized eigenspaces v 1 direct sum etcetera direct sum v i. So, this is the ultimate result. So, this is called the primary decomposition of this capital V with respect to this operator T. So, how one proves this? So, there are many consequences of this uh, primary decomposition theorem. We will actually come to that uh, in a minute. So, first let us prove this. So, to prove this uh, statement we need to prove two things. So, here is the proof. So, first we need to prove that V must be sum of these spaces V 1 etcetera V r. So, this is the step 1. Step 2 will be V must be isomorphic to or equal to this V 1 direction etcetera V r. So, in order to prove that we have to prove V i intersection if I take any sum of V j, j not equal to i. So, this intersection must be 0. So, that is what we need to prove and this is true for all i 1 less than equal to 1 less than r. So, if we prove these two things that actually tells us that V is actually equal to V 1 direction etcetera V r. So, let us prove one by one. So, to prove the first statement all we need to actually use the information that is given about this uh, minimal polynomial. So, note that the minimal polynomial is written as product of this linear factors. So, if we collect the roots uh, distinct roots then with the multiplicity we are writing it as x minus lambda 1 power a 1 etcetera x minus lambda r power a r. So, now using this uh, information we are going to construct uh, some polynomials uh, they are actually mutually relatively prime. So, they are just relatively prime ok. Let us see how one construct this. So, to prove first statement. So, what we do we we take this polynomial f i of x. So, which is nothing but you take m t of x divided by x minus lambda i power a i. So, note that if we vary this i f 1 of x etcetera f r of x. So, that will be relatively prime. So, what is the meaning of that? So, there are there is no common factor for all these polynomials. So, because every time for each i we are actually ignoring the root x minus lambda i power m i. So, that means, if we take collect them together then there is no common root for all this f 1 etcetera f r. So, that proves these polynomials are relatively prime. In particularly if we take this ideal generated by this polynomials. So, that will be containing 1. So, it must be equal to C x ok as they are relatively prime. So, this implies there exists some B 1 x etcetera B r x coming from this C x such that the combination of this will be 1. So, 1 can be written as B 1 of x times F 1 of x plus etcetera plus B r of x F r of x equal to 1. So, this is happening inside C x. So, now what we can do we can apply this evolution map. So, apply this evolution map to the star. So, then we get b 1 of t 
f1 of t plus etc plus br of t f r of t equal to identity on capital V. So, in particularly for given vector v in capital V, so I, we can actually just apply that vector on the left side and right side. On the right side we have identity, so get we get v. On the left side we get b1 of t, f1 of t v plus etc plus br of t, f r of t v. So, in particularly if we take u i to be this b i of t, f i of t v, then it is easy to see that this t minus lambda i identity power this a i. If you apply it on u i, so that is going to give us b i of t, t minus lambda i identity power this a i times f i of t times v. But note that this f i of t times this t minus lambda i power a i that is nothing but the minimal polynomial. So, that is how we have defined this uh, f i of t. So, in particularly f i of t sorry times t minus lambda i power a i is nothing but m t of t. Okay. So, what we get on the right side this is b i of t times m t of t v, but m t of t is identically 0 on capital V. So, that implies this is 0. So, this proves that this u i is in the kernel of this t minus lambda i identity power a i. So, which is nothing but capital V i. So, if we go back, so then what we have proved given vector v in v. So, we have written this v as u 1 plus etcetera plus u r where this each u i is coming from capital V i. So, that proves capital V is nothing but sum of these spaces v 1 etcetera v r. So, this is the proof of first statement. The second statement we need to prove that if we take v i intersection summation v j, j not equal to i. So, that should be identically 0 or equivalently any v in v can be written as uniquely v equal to u 1 plus etcetera plus u r where u i is coming from this capital V i. So, this V i being intersection with uh, 0 and V being equal to V 1 plus etcetera plus V r is equivalent to. So, these two statements they are equivalent to any V can be written as uniquely as elements of this uh, capital V i. Okay. So, let us prove one of this that is enough. Suppose if we write v equal to uh, u 1 plus etcetera u r and u 1 dash plus etcetera u r dash. So, then you can see that 0 can be written in two ways. Okay. So, this is uh, it is enough to prove the following. It is enough to prove that If 0 equal to u 1 plus etcetera plus u r, then that should imply u i is 0 for each i 1 to etcetera. In suppose u 1 plus etcetera plus u r is being 0, then that will imply that u i is equal to minus u 1 plus etcetera u i hat plus etcetera plus u r. So, this hat means we remove that term, we remove that ui term 
in that expression. So, that means, so u i we have written as summation u j j naught equal to i. So, now note that if I take this polynomial again f i of x which is m t of x divided by this x minus lambda i power a i and this x minus lambda i power a. So, they are relatively prime or relatively prime as they have different roots okay. because the only roots for this x minus lambda i power a is lambda i, but m t of x divided by this x minus lambda i power a it will have roots other than all this uh, lambda i. So, those lambda j which are not lambda i. So, that means these two polynomials are relatively prime. So, there exists some a x and b x such that the combination of this a x f i of x plus b f x x minus lambda i power this a i. So, that will be 1. Now, again apply this uh, operator evaluation t to this double star. So, then we get identity v equal to a of t f i of t plus b of t t minus lambda i power a i. So, now you can see that if you for this u i which we have written it as summation u j j naught equal to i we get for this u i which is summation u j j naught equal to i we get on the one hand u i by applying the identity on the left hand side. On the right hand side we get a t f i of t u i plus b of t t minus lambda i power a i u i. Note that u i is coming from this capital V i that implies t minus lambda i power a i u i is 0. And since u k is coming from V k for all k not equal to i, so that implies this summation u j j not equal to i. So, this is killed by this f i of t. So, this put together we get u i equal to 0 plus 0. So, that implies u i equal to 0. So, this proves u i is 0. So, this implies summation u j j not equal to i that is also 0. Now, by induction you can actually prove all other u case are 0. Now, by induction we can prove that u j s are all 0 for all j. So, that implies v is actually v 1 direct sum etcetera direct sum v r. So, this is what we get. So, now once we know this primary decomposition then we can actually uh, get uh, many information about the operator t. So, that is what uh, we are going to actually see as corollaries. Okay. So, before getting into the corollary again let us recall what is the primary decomposition theorem. So, you start with uh, v being a finite dimensional space t is acting on this v that means it is on linear operator on v. So, then take this minimal polynomial of t which we call it m t of x and factorize that into product of linear factors and collect uh, factors with the multiplicity call lambda 1 occurs with a 1 multiplicity lambda r occurs with a r multiplicities. Then define this generalized eigenspace kernel of t minus lambda i i identity power a i which is v i. So, then what we have? We have v equal to v 1 direct sum etcetera v r. So, that means v can be written as direct sum of these generalized eigenspaces. Note that these 
VIs, they are all T invariant subspaces as being kernel of some polynomial in T. Okay. So, some important uh, consequences from the primary decomposition which I am going to state now. So, V we have written as V1 direct sum etcetera VR where V i is nothing but the kernel of T minus lambda i identity V power A i where this m t of x we have written it as x minus lambda 1 power a 1 etcetera x minus lambda r power a r. Okay. Now, note that each v i is t invariant subspace. capital V. And now, this T minus lambda i identity V. So, this is nilpotent operator. This is nilpotent operator on this capital V. So, you can see that. So, lambda i is the only eigenvalue. Lambda i is the only eigenvalue on this capital V i. So, one way to notice this suppose uh, we have mu is another eigenvalue let us say mu is another eigenvalue of T on this V i. Then T w will be equal to mu w for some uh, w inside non zero w inside v i. So, now you can see that if you take this T minus lambda i identity on this uh, power m i and then evaluate on the w, then since T acts as mu times w, then this left hand side will be the polynomial in T. So, each T power will act like a mu power of W. So, in particularly this T minus lambda i will act as mu minus lambda i power sorry power A i. <coughs> we have denoted this by A i. A w equal to mu minus lambda i power A i w. So, since w is coming from this capital V i which is the kernel of T minus lambda i power A i. So, this part will be 0. So, that will imply that mu minus lambda i power A i will be 0 as w being non 0. So, that would imply that mu equal to lambda i. So, that means, lambda i is the only eigenvalue of capital T on capital V i. Okay. So, now what we are going to do? Uh, we are going to use this information uh, to write down capital T as sum of two operators. So, one is actually what is called semi simple operator, another one is called nilpotent operator. So, semi simple operator, so let us recall the definition. So, recall an operator. S is from capital V to V is said to be semi simple if the minimal polynomial of S has only distinct roots. So, that means so, each lambda i occurs with only multiplicity at most 1. So, then m s of x can be written as x minus lambda 1 etcetera x minus lambda r where this lambda 1 etcetera lambda r they are all distinct. 
So, this is what we call we say that uh, this minimal polynomial has only distinct roots. So, if we are working over algebraically closed field in our case we are working over complex numbers. So, then it is clear that uh, this uh, operator being semi simple is equivalent to uh, the operator is being diagonalizable. Okay. So, this is I will leave it as exercise. So, S is actually S is from V to V is semi simple if and only if S is diagonalizable. So, if we take this as a definition that the minimal polynomial has only distinct roots, then it is easy to prove that restriction of any semi simple operator must be semi simple. Suppose u is subspace of v, so let us call it w, let us say w is a subspace of T invariant subspace. and T is semi simple so then T restricted to W which is an operator from W to W is also semi simple. Note that the minimal polynomial of this restriction should divide the minimal polynomial of the original map. So, since this original map empty of S has distinct roots, so that should imply that this M T restricted to W of X also has distinct roots. So, that implies this uh, T restricted to W is also semi simple. So, restriction of nilpotent operator is nilpotent that is easy to see. So, restriction of this diagonalizable operator over C is also diagonalizable that is what this uh, uh, observation says. Okay. Now, what we do we actually write down our T as uh, sum of two operators. So, one is actually using uh, one is a semi simple operator another one is the nilpotent operator and this way of writing will be unique okay so this is the important corollary which i which i want to write it here so given this t from v to v where the dimension v is finite dimensional as always so we can write uniquely T as sum of two operators S plus N satisfying the following conditions. Satisfying the conditions both this S and N are commutes with T. S is semi simple. n is nilpotent and both of them actually commute s n is 0 and T s is also 0 T n is also 0. So, they commute with each other and they also commute with T. So, T can be written as sum of the semi simple and nilpotent operators satisfying these properties and this is actually unique with respect to these properties. So, let us see how to prove this. So, we already seen that V can be written as uh, sum of these uh, generalized eigenspaces. So, now using that uh, we are going to actually locate the semi simple and uh, nilpotent operators. So, what we do? So, note that this lambda 1 etcetera lambda r they are distinct complex numbers. So, now because uh, 
they are all actually distinct complex numbers. So, the corresponding x minus lambda i power e i. So, they are all mutually or pairwise relatively prime. Okay. So, this is pairwise relatively prime polynomials. So, since they are pairwise relatively prime polynomials, now we can use Chinese remainder theorem to locate some polynomial p of x. Okay. So, using Chinese remainder theorem, we can choose we can choose p of x inside C x such that this p of x congruent to lambda i modulo this t minus lambda i power this a i. So, we can also if if 0 is one of the root then we can make sure that this p of x is actually has constant term 0 or otherwise what we can do we can just add this uh, uh, 0 inside this lambda i and then we can make sure that this p of x is actually congruent to 0 modulo t 0 modulo x. Sorry. So, how one can do like if one of the lambda i if one of the lambda i is actually 0 then this star is actually is extra. Otherwise just add that with your uh, polynomials just otherwise add x with all other polynomials. So, that we get uh, pairwise relatively prime polynomials uh, and using uh, Chinese remainder theorem we will be able to locate this p of x such a way that p of x is congruent to lambda i modulo x minus lambda i power a i and p of x is congruent to 0 modulo x. So, now what we do we take this capital S to be p of t and capital N to be just t minus p of t. So, then it is clear that this s plus n is nothing but t. So, that is the first constraint which is satisfied. Now, we want to verify this s is indeed semi simple and this n is indeed nilpotent. So, let us see how actually this works out. So, note that if I take s which is p of t. So, when I restrict to capital V i. So, then what we get? So, we get exactly equal to. So, since p of x is congruent to lambda i modulo x minus lambda i power power a i. So, we get p of x equal to lambda i plus some multiple of let us call it q x x minus lambda i power a i q i of x. Okay. So, if we use this evaluation at t, so then we get p of t is equal to lambda i times identity plus q i of t times t minus lambda i power a i. So, in particularly if you evaluate p of t at some v where for v in capital V i we get p of t v equal to which is s v lambda i times v plus q i of t times t minus lambda i power a i v. But v is coming from capital V i. So, t minus lambda i power a i will kill. So, that will imply that s v is equal to lambda i v. So, since s restricted to capital V i is nothing but lambda i 
restricted on V i. So, that implies that S is actually semi simple. So, this is true for each i. So, that implies S is semi simple operator, semi simple or diagonalizable. So, in particularly you can see that the minimal polynomial of S which is defined on capital V is nothing but x minus lambda 1 times etcetera x minus lambda r. So, this is the minimal polynomial. So, now let us look at what happens to this uh, capital N. So, again what is capital N? Capital N is nothing but T minus P of T. So, if we go back to actually the way we wrote P of x. So, P of x is nothing but lambda i plus q i of x x minus lambda i power a i. So, then if we rewrite that p of x equal to lambda i plus q i of x x minus lambda i power a i. Then we get p of t to be equal to lambda i times identity plus q i of t times t minus lambda i power a i. So, now you can see that n restricted to V i is nothing but T restricted to V i minus P of T restricted to V i, but P of T restricted to V i will be equal to lambda i times V i. So, this part will become 0. So, T minus lambda i power a i restricted to V i will be 0. So, that implies this is T minus restricted to V i minus lambda i restricted to identity. So, that means n is nothing but T minus lambda i identity on capital V i, but since T minus lambda i power a i is 0 on capital V i that implies that n is nil potent on this capital V i and this is true for each i. So, that implies n is nil potent on capital V. Okay. So, this way we have written capital T as capital S plus capital N where S is semi simple and N is nil potent. Note that every time we have used polynomial in T to write capital S and capital N. So, since S is polynomial in T which has constant term 0 and n is also polynomial in T which has constant term 0. Okay. So, that means both S and n they commute with T and they also commute with each other. Okay. So, since both of them actually have constant term 0, if T maps some subspace invariant, let us say W is actually T invariant subspace. So, that would imply that both this capital S and capital N, they also map the W as S and N invariant. Okay. So, this is some observation. So, what is observation which will be very useful later? If W is mapped by T, then that implies S also maps W to W and N also maps W to W as S and N are polynomials in T with constant term 0. So, now let us actually prove that uh, this uh, both S and uh, N are unique. Okay. In case if we can write T as S plus N plus equal to S dash plus N dash, assume that S and N and S dash and both satisfy the hypothesis of the theorem. So, that means S S dash S is semi simple N is nil potent and S dash is semi simple and N dash is nil potent <coughs> and both S and N commutes with T as well as itself. Similarly, S dash N dash commutes and they also commute with uh, T. 
So, if all these are true then we want to prove that S and S dash are equal and N and N dash are equal. So, the trick is just to rewrite uh, S plus N equal to S dash S plus N dash as S minus S dash equal to N dash minus N. Note that the left hand side you have semi simple operators sum of 2 semi simple operator the right hand side you have sum of 2 nil potent operators. Since this S and N both are like we already seen that <coughs> S and N both are polynomials in T. So, that it will imply S dash and N dash both both actually commute with T sorry commute with S and N S dash N dash both commute with S and N. So, in particularly this S S dash they commute they are both semi simple that implies their addition is also semi simple. So, this side will be again semi simple operator and N n n dash they commute with each other both are nil potent that implies the difference is also nil potent operator. So, one side you have semi simple operator and the other side you have nil potent operator, but nil potent operator you know that the characteristic polynomial is uh, x power the dimension of the space and the minimal polynomial is just x and for the semi simple operator the minimal polynomial should be product of the the distinct roots x minus lambda 1 etcetera x minus lambda r which is equal to x that would imply that this uh, semi simple operator s minus s dash is equal to 0. So, that means s equal to s dash so that also will imply n equal to n dash. So, this proves actually both s and n they are actually unique. determined by the conditions that we have. Okay, so, this proves that any operator actually can be written as uh, sum of uh, 2 semi simple operator and nil potent operator. So, this is actually will be called referred as uh, Jordan Chevalier decomposition. Okay. So, we will actually talk about this lot in the following lectures. So, we will just record it as Jordan Chevalier additive version of decomposition. Jordan Chevalier additive decomposition of t ok. Ok, I will stop here and uh, I will continue next time with uh, what is called this abstract Jordan decomposition and cotton cretins of semi simple algebras as well as soluble algebras. Thank you very much, thanks.